E ora invitiamo subito le Catherine Whistler e Rachel Boyd del, um, dell'Ashmole uh, Museum di Oxford, le colleghe che sono impegnate nel... Abbiamo anche Mariangela Sceto in, in sala e che non parla, ma insomma è una delle presenze attive in questo progetto. E, um, il titolo che allora hanno scelto è estremamente in, in linea con le nostre richieste, cioè proprio la catalogazione dei disegni dell'Ashmole Museum di Oxford. Nel, qui nel, nell'ambito del paper project del Ghetti. Non c'è bisogno di presentarle, in particolare Catherine Winsor a Firenze. Grazie. Buonasera. Aspetta. È accesa. Mi sentite tutti? Allora, sono Catherine Whistler, sono qui con Rachel Boyd, siamo contentissimi di fare parte di questa giornata sul disegno, però dobbiamo chiedere la vostra pazienza perché facciamo la nostra presentazione in inglese. Okay. So, we're delighted to be here today to present the Ashmolean Italian Drawings online cataloging project. And we're very grateful to the Getty Foundation for the research grant, which supports the training of curators as well as the cataloging of the collection. We've had two Ashmolean Getty Fellows, first Dr. Ian Hicks and now Dr. Rachel Boyd. <laughs> Grazie. Thank you, Chris. And with the additional support of the Tavolozza Foundation, we've also had an experienced scholar for a time on our project, Angela Maria Aceto, who's here today. Please note the project does not include the Ashmolean's famous collection of Michelangelo and Raphael drawings. That those are the subject of other um, types of research. So the drawings that we are cataloging, about 2,400 in all, from the late 15th century down to the 19th century, are truly fascinating. And here's just a selection from at top left, Filippino Lippi's design for an ephemeral chariot from about 1490 in Florence, to at bottom right, Francesco Grandi's design for a theater curtain at the Teatro Comunale in Fano in 1857. They include independent drawings such as the landscape by Alessio de Marquis and designs for prints such as the Guido Reni of about 1640. And most of them were made with paintings or other public works in mind. They were part of a creative process and a design process. The majority were not intended to be seen outside of the artist's studio. They are rarely, if ever, signed. And these fragile sheets of paper have survived the risks of damage or destruction over time, passing through the hands of different owners and collectors who have often left inscriptions or marks. So our concern with cataloging is with these questions. Who made this drawing? When was it made? When and where? How was it made? Why was it made? What function did it have at the time and what happened to it subsequently? Now, our online catalogue is intended to be concise on the one hand, but also accessible to a general audience, as well as useful for scholars. Some drawings are already well known. This one by Giovanni Battista Tiepolo is a detailed study for the foreshortened head of a man at the lower left of a fresco that he would paint at the Villa Cordellina. This was already known when the drawing was purchased in 1941. However, close scrutiny of drawings is fundamental. Ian Hicks noticed for the first time that the outlines of the, drawings are in, of the drawing are incised, a process that would help someone to copy it exactly, copying being part of artistic education in the studio. At the right, this dynamic drawing by Titian is a study for a salient element in a painting, also at the lower left, his battle painting in the Palazzo Ducale Venezia, destroyed by fire in 1577, but known through copies such as this painted copy in the Ashmolean. Again, 
careful scrutiny has shown that a cut-off inscription is in the same handwriting as an inscription on a drawing by Titian in the Uffizi, which has been in that collection since 1671. Since we already know from the collector's marks on the drawing that our Titian came to England from Venice in the early 17th century, we can now place it and the Uffizi drawing in the same collection in Venice around the early 1600s. However, many drawings remain anonymous. Now, some can be placed geographically and chronologically. This design with two contrasting figures from classical mythology has the outlines pricked for transfer to another surface. The contours are very strongly marked, so the ultimate work might have been viewed from a distance, perhaps part of a decorative frieze high on the walls of a room. The visual language is absolutely typical of mid-16th century Tuscany, deriving directly from Giorgio Vasari. So it's close to Vasari, but is it by his hand? We're inclined to think that the quality is not quite right and that it must be by a Tuscan Roman artist who is very familiar with Vasari's work. Of course, we also drill down to understand more about anonymous works. When this drawing came to us in 1863, it was said to be by Titian. While previously regarded as a copy of Titian's altarpiece of the martyrdom of St. Lawrence, in fact, it's based on an engraving by Cornelius Court. The print, in turn, presents an interpretation of two different martyrdom paintings by Titian, each nocturnal scenes. The unknown 17th century artist used red chalk strongly to suggest the color and warmth of the flames and torches in the paintings. This is not a conventional copy, that is to say, of an engraved composition. In our cataloging work, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. Apart from the Michelangelo and Raphael collection that came to the university in 1846, the Ashmolean's Italian drawings collection was largely built up by Carl Parker, who was keeper from 1934 until 1962 and designed our handsome print room. In 1956, Parker published a catalog of the Italian drawings, 1,141 entries at the time, that remains exemplary in its scholarship with many ideas on attributions that later research has shown to be correct. However, in keeping with museum conventions at the time, Parker omitted many drawings, especially copies, and he gave only minimal listings of architectural and ornament drawings in our three Talman albums, and also drawings in other albums such as these two examples. A rare aspect of Karl Parker's practice as a curator and connoisseur is shown in this brief case study. Parker catalogued this small sketch, which was a gift from Hans Kalman in 1945, as a figure subject by Parmigianino, noting just some unrelated drapery indications in black chalk. When Ian, began, Ian Hicks began working on his catalogue entries on Parmigianino, he discovered in the museum archive this curious collage. You can see here an index card with Parker's notes and a fragmentary black chalk drawing pasted onto that card. Using digital tools, Ian was able to understand the relationship of the two fragments and to discuss the attribution, convincingly showing that this is by a copyist of Parmigianino, an Emilian artist of the next generation. In 1980, Hugh MacAndrew published a supplementary catalogue, including drawings acquired since 1956. He also tackled a major omission from Parker's catalogue, the omission of the so-called unmounted series. MacAndrew provided a valuable checklist of 383 mainly anonymous drawings, including many copies. So our project involves updating Carl Parker, obviously, and cataloguing the works omitted by Parker and these formerly unmounted series more fully, and we've made various identifications. For instance, MacAndrew listed this attractive sheet as anonymous Florentine, but Angela Maria was able to connect it directly with a painting by Francesco Vanni, as you can see here. 
The collection has grown since 1980, and internationally, of course, research on drawings has advanced. Parker and McAndrew relied on black and white photographs when available, and on the advice of other scholars. In today's digital world, we have many more advantages, including Zoom workshops, which have proven invaluable, particularly during the pandemic. The maker of this drawing, cataloged by McAndrew as an anonymous follower of Barocci, remained elusive until very recently. Ian and Angela Maria had conducted extensive research on the sheet, finding similarities with drawings by artists such as Giovanni Battista Trotti, but it was not until we brought it to the attention of other scholars at Zoom workshops in 2021 that a compelling attribution could be made. And we'd like to say here, of course, that we're grateful to Simonetta and to many other scholars, including many in this room, for kindly giving their time and energy to our workshops. So following suggestions from Jonathan Bober and Hugo Chapman, we looked into the graphic production of the Cremonese painter Antonio Maria Viani, and we discovered that the handling of our saint is nearly identical to these other sheets, convincingly attributed to Viani by Giulio Bora. It's clear that these are by the same artist, and we're grateful to our generous colleagues for their keen eyes and visual memory, which have proven immensely helpful on this and other occasions. Other crucial digital tools at our disposal, which were not available to Parker and MacAndrew, are imaging techniques, such as some that you've seen already in the Dresden presentation. And our paper conservators do carry out some investigations to assist with questions on materials, but I should say we're a very small university museum and they have very little time. In this case, I wanted to know if this blue watercolour correction to the head of the child was contemporary to the drawing or was it a later retouching, perhaps by a collector. By examining the layering of the drawing materials, our paper conservators confirmed that it was contemporary. It's integral to the drawing. And this is further evidence to support the argument that the drawing is not a creative work, but is a studio copy of a lost drawing by Bellini. And sometimes all we need is a torch. These studies after antique models were long thought to be by an Italian artist of the early 16th century, but Angela Maria identified this watermark that you can see, which proves that the paper is from the Netherlands, produced around the 1530s, so that the dating is later than traditionally thought, and the artist was probably European, Northern European, copying <coughs> earlier antiquarian models. Other kinds of inscriptions, of other kinds of evidence is provided by inscriptions on the drawings or on the old mounts. This previously anonymous drawing has some very early handwriting, giving, in fact, an artist's name in a specifically Venetian form, Nadalini da Morano. The imagery, of course, refers to Giorgione and Titian quite directly. The subject is enigmatic, and all of this is typical of Venetian early Cinquecento domestic painting. Intriguingly, there is much documentary evidence about an artist from Murano, Nadalino da Murano, who was a member of Titian's workshop and active from the 1520s to the 1550s. But no actual paintings by him have been securely identified, and absolutely no drawings are known. Yet his name must have been well known in mid to late 16th century Venice and the early, indeed I think Venetian, owner of this drawing recorded his authorship. For that reason alone, this attribution carries much authority and I should say I'm very grateful to Alberto Casciello for discussing this with me. As well as the visual clues carried by drawings, we obviously look for related works of art that can help us to identify the artist. This previously anonymous drawing with a devotional image of St. Catherine of Siena was in fact the model for a print published in Siena designed by Ventura Salimbeni. The contours of the drawing have been incised with a stylus so as to transfer the design to another sheet which was then the direct model for the engraver around 1597. And we're keen also to look at the full sheet of paper as a material object, but many drawings were mounted with the recto visible 
and the verso glued down and concealed. And actually, we have very little opportunity to reveal versos. It's something we can only very rarely ask our paper conservators to do. When Karl Parker acquired this drawing in 1943, it was attributed to Francesco Maffei. But I've been able to confirm that it is by a later artist, because it directly connects to a painting, a later artist in Venice, Giuseppe Camerata. Until recently, only the recto was visible, although Parker recorded that there were some unimportant sketches on the back. So we decided to try, in this case, to look. Our paper conservators began to reveal these, and they've now been fully revealed. As you can see, a red chalk possibly drawn from the model, and a very inventive pensiero in pen and ink and wash. And these are studies which shed light on the drawing practice of Camerata, whose practice is very little known. Investigating what previous scholars have thought on attributions is important, although in the Ashmolean our documentation is extremely thin. Sadly, Karl Parker kept little of his extensive correspondence, and as a university museum with small numbers of staff, it's been impossible to maintain the detailed documentation that one finds in, in national or, or larger museums. We have very precious information kept in our interleaved volumes of Parker 1956 and MacAndrew 1980. These are unique archival records with notes by the authors themselves and by visiting scholars over the years, as you can see here. And of course, we also find notes on the mounts of drawings. And our research is not carried out in isolation, as with our Dresden colleagues. With, with Getty funding, we've been able to invite some specialists to Oxford, especially before the pandemic. And Chris Fisher, who's here, came and gave us the most wonderful advice. Um, we also invited Carol Van Tyl, who, uh, on, on visiting in late 2019, immediately identified this very damaged drawing as almost certainly by Ludovico Calacci from late in his career. And as well as our own networks, we of course benefit enormously from the work and publications of other scholars. In Paragone, in July 2021, Paolo Ervas argued convincingly that this beautiful compositional drawing, which is significant also for its alternative frame designs, is in fact by Bartolomeo Ramenghi, known as Bagna Cavallo Sr. Traditionally attributed to Girolamo da Santa Croce, very unconvincingly, the drawing subsequently had another unconvincing attribution to Boccaccio Boccaccino. So we are delighted to bring a new artist to our drawings collection, Banya Cavallo Sr. And we are always keen to identify new artists. John Lorenzo Bernini, of course, is a famous name in Roman Baroque art and architecture, and these compelling portrait drawings are by his hand. This one seems to be a copy of a late self-portrait, and copying was, of course, an essential part of artistic training. It has an old inscription on the back, Agnese Celeste B. Could this be a drawing by Bernini's daughter, Agnese, born in 1647? In other cases, however, we must be sure to take early attributions with a grain of salt. So this pen and wash drawing of St. Agatha in prison was inscribed on the verso Elisabetta. The hand is clearly early, so Parker, with good reason, catalogued it as a drawing by Elisabetta Sirani, although no related painting or etching survives, and it has not appeared in the Sirani literature. When cataloging it, I was curious about the technique as much as the subject matter, and I noticed that there were substantial incisions, possibly preparatory as well as black chalk underdrawings, and that the handling of the pen seemed different in character from that in our better known Elisabetta Sirani drawings. So we consulted Babette Bon and received an interesting suggestion that the drawing may well in fact be by Elisabetta's father, Giovanni Andrea. Giovanni relied more on pen work than did his daughter, and comparisons with drawings like this one in the Uffizi are compelling. So we will take the opportunity, of course, while we're here in Florence, to examine this and other Sirani drawings closely and see if we can definitively reattribute this drawing to Elisabetta's father. And while physical examination of drawings is fundamental to the work that we do as drawing scholars, there are, of course, as we mentioned already, some important advantages to working in the digital age. 
These two drawings, for example, which are in one of our anonymous boxes, were cataloged by McAndrew as anonymous Bolognese, the pen and ink sheet preparatory for an altarpiece and the red chalk a copy of it. But names and identification of any related projects remained elusive. I was intrigued by the subject matter, probably related to an episode of the plague, and so I spent a little time searching key terms in other image and collections databases last year. And I soon discovered that the drawings clearly relate to this rare 1719 etching of the Madonna del Soccorso in Bologna, a miraculous sculpture who saved the city from the plague in 1527 and who continued to be invoked in times of difficulty in the following centuries. The print itself clearly states that it was designed um, by Gioacchino Pizzoli and etched by Ludovico Mattioli, the latter one of the most important collaborators of Giuseppe Maria Crespi. Virtual consultations with drawing specialists, including Marco Ricomini, John Marchari, and Florian Herb were extremely helpful in confirming an attribution to Mattioli for both of our drawings, so we have now happily established a name and we have a much better, a much clearer understanding of the subject matter. In this instance, we benefited greatly from the availability of images and information online that we would not have been able to turn up in our local libraries. The impression of the print I'm showing you is the only one I've been able to locate, although I'd be very grateful for any other information. So it's extremely helpful that the Archigenasio made it available online, as I wouldn't have been able to find it quite so quickly and easily during a period of travel restrictions. And this, in turn, is one of the considerations that we are keeping in mind as we prepare data to be published in our catalog. Maintaining keywords, including former titles and former attributions, is essential not only for our own internal records, but also for scholars conducting research in the future. So to move towards concluding, our research questions and the methodologies that we are using can be transformative in changing our understanding of the technique, the function, and the histories of drawings, or indeed our understanding of drawings as material and as material artifacts in social and cultural history. Drawings have often been marginalized in the wider art historical discourse, but I think we can all in this room imagine and know how drawings can act as portals in opening up new areas for research. Some pragmatic issues we want to consider to bring to the table are, first, who are the audiences for an online catalogue? What kind of tone of voice should we use in addressing them? So in in um, presenting this drawing online, for example, the catalogue entry will have to discuss the unusual iconography, the function of the drawing, and the history of the attribution. It's an unmounted sheet, which was in an indeterminate box, as possibly by an artist from the Netherlands. When Jane Turner visited and went through the box, she said, not Netherlands, this is Spanish. In investigating this possibility and investigating the iconography, because Cartesian subjects were particularly popular in mid-17th century Spain, I found this engraving. And in fact, the contours of the figures and of the lectern in our drawing are incised for transfer. And I just want to show you in the next slide two examples of the kinds of catalogue entries and information that will appear online in 2024. So on the left you can see a relatively short entry on the Vasari type drawing the cartonetto that you saw earlier and on the right the more lengthy discussion of the funeral of St Raymond Diocres um, that you have just seen. We, we feel it's terribly important. It's, a, it's our responsibility coming from a university museum to ensure that our online resource will be of interest to a diverse and global audience, but it has to be based on rigorous scholarship. That is our duty. Other kinds of accessibility, of course, related to online catalogues rather than printed catalogues include the value of updating the resource easily because, as with Dresden, all of our work is carried out on a collections database which feeds, will feed the online catalogue. But they also allow the 
online catalogues also allow every drawing to be accessible without the need for um, complicated arrangements that we find in printed catalogues, such as dividing the collection alphabetically or into works from a particular century or indeed from a particular region. So we can be inclusive and sometimes we can rethink previous taxonomies. So for instance, with this drawing, uh, Ian Hicks has established on philological as well as stylistic grounds that this is by uh, Romulo Cincinato during his time in Spain. Normally one would say, well, should we consider it to be a Spanish drawing or an Italian drawing? We prefer to allow this drawing to remain in the catalogue, in the Italian catalogue, partly because of its previous history of attribution, as well as for other pragmatic reasons, the likelihood of a Spanish drawings catalogue being several decades away. An important issue for the project, however, is how do we reconcile our ambition to research every drawing thoroughly with the challenge of the sheer size of the Ashmolean collection? And it's important to learn, certainly has been important for me, to learn to prioritize and to know when to stop working on a particular drawing. A catalog, digital or printed, presents just a snapshot of our current knowledge. It can be updated, and others will necessarily take the research forward. For example, this signed and dated contract and set of drawings for a glazed terracotta tondo is of immense rarity and importance as the sole surviving secure drawing to come down to us from the prolific Della Robbia workshop. As a Della Robbia specialist myself, I have searched and searched and searched for the sculpture recorded in this sheet, visiting closed churches and convents and photographic archives, but I've not turned it up yet. But of course, this is just one drawing among thousands, and at some point I've simply had to set the matter aside and conclude that perhaps the sculpture was simply never finished or has been lost to time. But of course, I'll always remain on the lookout for these and so many other ideas recorded in the drawings that we are cataloging. And indeed, that is the question of how much time one has to spend. And as with our Dresden colleagues, we have taken opinions from many people. Um, for example, this naturalistic head study, which is quite playful in its approach, had a traditional attribution to Anibale Caracci, which is not quite correct. Julian Brook suggested instead it might be Florentine, close even to Lorenzo Lippi. But then Chris Fisher, visiting, observed a Neapolitan quality, which actually I found <laughs> convincing, notably in the dense of the red chalk and the treatment of the, the little wisps of hair that recall Ribera red chalk drawings. But Gabriele Finaldi is absolutely not convinced and does not think it's by Ribera or any of his Neapolitan contemporaries. And indeed, at a Zoom workshop in late November 2021, the general feeling of those present was that we should retain it as Florentine. And the last, just to show you another problem drawing, which again, how much time can one spend? Um, this is an attractive sheet which at different Zoom workshops a variety of scholars have commented on. We have had very strong views that it must be Tuscan with Barocci influences and equally strong views that it must be Venetian. Um, <laughs> at a certain point one has to simply make a decision and then await correction by future scholars. So the last thing to note is that um, as tensions, well, that our work is essentially focused on the sheets of paper as material objects. But travel has become more restricted in our field, not only because of the pandemic in recent years, but limited budgets, limited museum budgets, limited grants, um, sustainability, our carbon footprints. We are very, very concerned about these issues. So a question for the future generation is, how is it possible for new researchers to build up the kinds of expertise in connoisseurship enjoyed by our predecessors, or that I have enjoyed, without regular direct physical access to the works of art. Can digital images in the end provide us with all of the information and knowledge that we need? That is a question. Uh -huh. And Rachel is just going to think. Uh -huh.
In conclusione vogliamo ringraziare tutti e soprattutto Simonetta e Catherine e la Fondazione Longhi per, per l'organizzazione e per l'invito. Siamo molto felici di essere qui insieme e per l'opportunità di collaborare e di conoscere meglio i progetti di catalogazione dei nostri colleghi. E naturalmente invitiamo domande o commenti in inglese o in italiano. Grazie. Thank <laughs> you.